What up, Coordination? Today on the pod, I've got Danielle Allen and Glenn Weil, who are two of the co-authors on a new paper entitled Ethics of Decentralized Sys- excuse me, Decentralized Social Technologies, Lessons from Web3, the Fediverse, and Beyond. Uh, Glenn and Danielle have co-authored the paper with Eli Frankel, Wujin Lim, Divya Siddharth, and Josh Simmons. Hopefully I pronounced everyone's names correctly. Danielle is a professor of political philosophy, ethics, and public policy at Harvard University. Glenn is research lead at Microsoft Research and the special project of the Plural Social Technology Collaboratory, the founder of Radical Exchange and the Plurality Institute, and the author of of the book Radical Markets. Uh, Glenn Danielle and their co-authors are contributors to the Getting Plurality Research Network at Harvard's uh, Edmund and Lily Safra Center for Ethics that is being launched today uh, in collaboration and support from Glenn's project at Microsoft. So um, as they co-author this paper, they are treating it as a founding document for that project. Um, I wanted to have them on the on the podcast because Glenn's work has been an inspiration for me. Well, back when I founded Gitcoin, it was uh, built on top of quadratic funding, which is something that Zoe Hitzig and Vitalik Buterin and Glenn invented together. Um, and I also just wanted to have Danielle and Glenn on the pod as I think their paper will be foundational for the Web3 transition uh, to a more regenerative and ethical economy as it grows and matures. So this podcast is all about ethics of decentralized social technologies. We talk about Web3's constitutional moment. Basically, constitutional moments are moments that lead to the transformation of a social platform, e.g. like the U.S. Constitution being on built on a social platform structured by the economics, demographics, and tech technological facts of the late 18th century. So this is a similar constitutional moment, we think, for Web3. Prudent vigilance, which is basically being explicit about goals and uh, offering justifications as we build projects, having governance structures to oversee the design and evaluation of experiments. Um, And then we also talk about just the values that Glenn and Danielle and their co-authors have brought from traditional political philosophy around human flourishing, things like non-domination, things like individual community self-determination, egalitarian pluralism, coordination capacity, collective ownership and regenerative economies. So I I really just enjoy every conversation I have with Glenn and Danielle. They're such rich, deep thinkers. And I think that this paper can be a foundational part of the plural and regenerative Web3 movement. So that's why I was really excited to have them on the pod. And I think that's why you're really going to enjoy this episode. So coordination, please enjoy this podcast episode on ethics of decentralized social technologies with Glenn and Danielle. Working in Web3 is awesome, but working outside of the typical W2 employee structure is a deal breaker for so many. Opolis is helping the self-sovereign worker focus on what they do best, their work. Tax time is coming up. Opolis helps professionalize your business by helping you form an entity, generate proof of employment through pay subs, and receive a W-2 at the end of the tax year. Are you self-employed and forced to spend money on expensive healthcare insurance with limited coverage? Opolis leverages group buying power through a community employment co-op, helping you save 20 to 50% on high quality, affordable healthcare options through Cigna. And finally, Opolis's member owners share in Opolis's success and profits based on their work token holdings. You must be authorized to work inside the United States in select Canadian provinces to receive Opolis's benefits. Book a 30-minute free consultation with Opolis's experts and join Opolis by March 31st, 2023 to get a thousand work and a thousand bank tokens. Go to connect.opolis.co slash bankless to get started. And if you're going to East Denver, make sure to stop by the Opolis booth or attend their Future of Work Summit hosted by Opolis. The Glow Dollar is a new stable coin with a very special property. As the market cap of Glow goes up, extreme poverty goes down. Glow is a dollar-backed, non-profit stable coin that creates basic income for people living in extreme poverty. Glow is basically the same business model as USDC with yield generating treasuries on one side and a stable coin on Ethereum on the other. But instead of being a for-profit company, Glow is a non-profit that donates 100% of all yields from the Glow Reserve to Give Directly's basic income program. Give Directly is a charity that gives people money, no strings attached, to people living in poverty and is a charity that Vitalik has previously donated to and supported in the past. With Glow, you can reduce poverty just by holding a stablecoin. Glow is launching in early 2023, and you can join the waitlist at glowdollar.org slash greenpill. That's G-L-O dollar dot org slash greenpill. Hey, Glenn. Hey, Danielle. How you doing? Hi, Kevin. Good to be with you. So glad to have you. So really excited about this new paper that you released. Can you tell me about the Plural Technology Collaboratory and what led you and your co-authors to write 
this paper on uh, ethics of decentralized uh, social tech. Go ahead, Glenn. So the Plural Technology Collaboratory is uh, a new special project at Microsoft Research, bringing together people throughout um, Microsoft Research, throughout the rest of Microsoft, and a number of partners, including Danielle's group at Harvard, folks at MIT, at Berkeley, on ventures and others. And what we're really trying to uh, uh, focus on has shifted a little bit. So when we started, well, we were originally the Decentralized Social Technology Collaboratory, and our mission was to deal with the social legitimacy issues that got in the way of uh, many folks adopting Web3 technology. Um, recently, we've rebranded we the Plural Technology Collaboratory, um, and we're responding to the moment with uh, generative foundation models, these large AI models like ChatGPT that a lot of people have been interacting with, um, which we believe are going to create an environment where uh, a lot of the challenges that people in Web3 face are faced by the broader society. And we're trying to scale up some of the insights from uh, the Web3 community to meet those uh, challenges. And one way that we're doing that is we're trying to involve uh, folks like uh, Danielle and uh, her colleagues at Harvard and elsewhere who bring that depth of philosophical and social insight that we need to confront these uh, enormous challenges. And I'll let Danielle speak to that, and then maybe she can speak to what interested in her on in working with us on this paper. Great, thanks. Yes, so we are launching, we have just launched a new research network at the Edmund and the Lily Stafford Center for Ethics. The network is called Getting Plurality, and that stands for Governance of Emerging Technology and Technology for Next Generation Governance Through Plurality. So we share Glenn's sense that a plural approach, plural technology is a focus on plurality, is really important for changing the direction of technology development and ensuring that we can build and use technologies that are supportive of democracy and other human goods. So we've pulled together a real multidisciplinary network. A core group of us um, have been working over the last nine months on this paper that we're also releasing today, the Decentralized Social Technologies paper, the Ethics for DSTs. Um, so we're really excited about this, and it really takes people from all disciplines, philosophy, political science, economics, as well as technologists, to face the hard questions we've got right now. Um, Kevin, would it be useful for me to say a little bit about what plurality is and like what where that catchphrase comes from? Yeah, please so, do. I think that uh, yeah, go ahead. Um, so I, I'm writing a book right now with Audrey Tong. It's a Git-based open collaboration that I hope many of people in the community will participate in, uh, and it's called plurality. That's a term that Audrey uses to uh, represent her vision for the future of technology. Audrey is the digital minister of Taiwan. And um, there's a lot to say about it. You and I have gone back and forth about it for a long time. But I think a simple way to think about it is that there's kind of two dominant visions for the future of technology today. One is very sort of individualistic. It's about like, you know, money and markets, and it's very dominant in the crypto world. There's a second vision that's about, you know, powerful AI systems replacing the need for an economy, replacing the need for work, et cetera. And uh, what we believe is that there's a better third vision that emphasizes social diversity, uh, you know, a diverse range of commons, cooperation across social differences, but also that supports and maintains and actually proliferates those social differences rather than uh, just sort of washing them away into a global system. So anyways, there's a lot to be said about that, but that's the basic frame that both the effort at Microsoft and the effort that Danielle uh, is highlighting at Harvard um, is trying to adopt. I Amazing. Would add Anything to, to add there, Danielle? Yeah. Go ahead. Thanks. Yeah, I would just add one thing. That was a great description, Glenn. The other piece that I always like to include is the point that human intelligence is plural. There are plural intelligences. And so the amplitude of human intelligence really requires recognizing that plurality and building from it and in support of that plurality, not undermining it, eroding it, homogenizing it, and so forth. And, and even human is perhaps just one 
part of it. Um, these machines as well, we should think of as diverse, as containing many different systems at many different scales, not as sort of homogeneous black boxes that bring down some, you know, a quantity called power or intelligence to be used for any purpose. Um, and that's something that we should desire and seek to proliferate as we build technology, uh, whether it be in human systems or beyond. So um, I really encourage everyone to go read the paper, but I'm wondering if we could if we could tee off the episode with a short summary or, or TLDR of the paper. How is it organized and, and what were the main messages you wanted to get across? Sure. Maybe I'll jump in and then Glenn can add um, as well as he sees fit. So the first and most important point is to say that recent technological developments do rise to the level of a constitutional moment. There's been a lot of controversy over how important are decentralized social technologies, how important are generative foundation models. And the paper is mostly focused on you know, DSOC, so blockchain, Fediverse a little bit. Blockchain is the sort of main example. Um, but the, the takeaway is, yes, it is a constitutional moment. The kinds of things these new technologies can do go to foundational elements of how society is structured. They affect core elements of how property operates, um, core elements of how identity operates and the like. And changes at that level will have fundamental impacts over time. We may not have seen those fundamental impacts yet. This is not to say that cryptocurrency as such is the fundamental impact, but the underlying technologies are transformative at a sort of deep constitutive level. So that's point one. And so then point two is, you know, what's an ethics for developing such technologies when the impacts are so substantial? We draw on some, you know, pre-existing examples from bioethics, sort of explore the landscape of how people have built different frameworks, you know, precautionary principle and the like. And we land on a recommendation for what we call prudent vigilance. Prudent vigilance is a framework where you expect uh, experimentalism. You're not trying to block it. You're not trying to make sure that you know, you know in advance that no harm will come, but you are building in processes to look for near-term and long-term uh, downstream consequences, um, harms, and so forth, and building in processes and practices as part of the technology development um, to mitigate those risks. Um, and then, of course, there's also the question of, can we take new technologies with constitutive power and not just avoid the harms um, that they cause, but also, in fact, deploy them to positive ends. So in some sense, the really important part of the paper, finally, is a picture of human flourishing and um, a vision for um, what we call either plural or plurality-based or power-sharing liberalism. Uh, it is exactly the, the directions that we are articulated with the plurality concept um, to start. And the question is, how can technology be used in this direction? Then, you know, the sort of question of, are there key technonormative concepts um, that are pertinent here? whether it's trustlessness, for example, or any of the others, and how do they map on to the values that we should want to bring to using technologies in this space? Um, I'm sure Glenn has lots to add, so let me pass it over to Glenn. I, I would just elaborate on Daniel's points, which I actually think were really the right ones. Um, one thing I would say is there's sort of a pull element, which Danielle emphasized, like what is it that uh, decentralized social technologies are empowering us to do? There's also a push element, which is that... Um, I increasingly believe that with the rise of powerful AI systems, many of the legacy systems that Web3 has proposed itself as a potential alternative to are simply just not going to be sustainable. Um, I think a lot of the authentication uh, that we've relied on, whether it be CAPTCHAs or talking to a loved one, is going to be very easily replicable. And so people are going to have to increasingly rely on these more sophisticated approaches, whether or not they prefer them because um, other forms of di digital authentication are going to evaporate. And so I think these technologies are going to be put in center stage one way or the other. Uh, uh, so it's important that we find what can be valuable about them. The second thing I'd say is just to make an analogy to Danielle's uh, idea of pr prudent vigilance for the context that's probably more familiar to your listeners. I think of it as a little bit being the ethics equivalent of the lean startup methodology. So, you know, in the lean startup methodology, you neither have like a plan that you're going to execute based on a careful analysis of every contingency, nor do you have just like you're sticking to the way that things have always been done. Both of those are inimical to this lean startup methodology. 
And within ethics, those roughly correspond to what's called utilitarianism and deontology. Utilitarianism is about like calculating everything out and you know making a the best plan, and deontology is all about following the rules. Um, prudent vigilance or lean startup methodology is about deliberately experimenting with something, trying to get as much information from that experiment as you can, and being ready to quickly pivot away from mistakes and towards potential, you know? And that's not a framework that's, I think, been translated fully to the ethics world. And I think one thing that is exciting beyond the applications here, which Danielle got at nicely, is, you know, there's also an insight for ethical theory here, which is about um, how to take some of the lessons that have been learned in the technology world and bring them to how we approach ethics in a context that requires that, where there's this constant change in, in the environment partly driven by our own actions. You know, what stands out for me, Glenn, as I hear you talk about this prudent vigilance in this constitutional moment is just all the foundational impacts of Web3 decentralized social technologies that you uh, identified in the paper, you and your co-authors identified in the paper. And uh, they're pretty foundational parts of of, of society, uh, titling and, and validation, notaries public, identification systems, fund transfers, media, social media, governance and voting, rewarding digital labor, property relationships, dispute resolution. So it feels like the stakes are pretty high here uh, to, to get this right. Um, can, can you say more about, uh, about what you would like to see in the Web3 ecosystem based off of what you've unveiled in this paper? So uh, to me, the... Um... The real challenge in the coming years for the Web3 ecosystem is going to be um, how to very rapidly be able to mainstream things uh, at much lower cost and much greater accessibility and uh, much greater sort of integration with mainstream values than has been achieved to date, um, and how to do that very quickly without um, necessarily uh, a ton of money backing it up, you know? Uh, and uh, it's gonna be a very interesting moment. So like to take an example from what you gave, um, suppose that, you know, generative AI advances very rapidly and this has wide scale impacts on creators. Um, and people, uh, you know, standard means of earning livelihood just sort of evaporates very quickly for a large segment of the population. Um, obviously there's been a lot of exploring using things like NFTs, um, alternatives to that. That was kind of an interesting sideshow, but there's a chance that that might become one of the primary possible sources of income for a significant chunk of people. And I don't think the system is really prepared for that. I don't think NFTs like have stabilized or come to a point that's socially legitimate or that is sort of, um, you know, consistent with the, the rest of society in a way that allows them to become a foundation for that many people's income. Um, but they might have to. So that's going to be, I think, a, huge demand and it's going to require the cooperation of lots of different parts of society including governments that have generally taken either a sort of reactive or a standoffish position uh, with regards to this space i think i would double click on glenn's comment about the need for integration with in some sense mainstream norms values and expectations in various ways for me, this is particularly true around the concept of governance. So I think Web3 technologies do provide innovative governance resources um, and tools. But at the same time, there's lots of sort of old fashioned kind of governance protocols that would have been relevant, for example, to, you know, the Sam Bankman fried collapse when I mean, they lacked basic governance things that people actually have known how to do for centuries. So I see the sort of fusion of some of the sort of old school thinking about governance with enablement through Web3 technologies is really promising. And I hope that there's a sort of openness to that kind of project of integration. 
Glenn, anything to add there? Uh, yeah, I mean, governance, there's a lot to say about governance. Governance is going to be a fascinating challenge. Um, you know, the, the, I've been working on some very out there governance stuff for a while and often pointing to Taiwan's example as one that's really impressive. Um, but I've increasingly come to think that even stuff that's well beyond uh, what's going on in Taiwan may be relatively short term necessary um, just to deal with some of these challenges uh, that I was that I was mentioning. So uh, it's, I it's think yeah going to be really an interesting there's also, there's, a, there's a challenge in that you know to date so much of the energy has been directed towards divining how the various web3 technologies can be used to generate value in a you know off, often frothy way right and instead of asking the question of which collective action problems or social organization sort of um, roadblocks or obstacles could these technologies resolve. And the truth of the matter is that there ought to be sort of value along those pathways as well and reward for pursuing them. But the structure of um, activity hasn't really directed energy in that way. So that's sort of the question for me is how to get people sort of directed towards seeing the, you know, the potential for positive social impact and exploring points of application where that could be realized. I mean, uh, people yeah. always say that fear and greed are the two great motivators. And I think one interesting thing that may happen in the coming years is the emphasis here may move from greed to fear a little bit. Like if a lot of traditional governance and uh, verification systems begin to fail and these uh, the possibilities in this space become fallbacks, things may become very real for people very quickly. For good or for and for ill, you know, uh, and people may be looking for ways to make things uh, work. That kind of happened to some extent with the Twitter, uh, you know, Twitter going south under Elon's management. But will um, we might see that at much broader scales for some of these other things, and and it might be generative or it might be uh, just as problematic. I'm, I'm not sure. We'll have to see. Well, I mean, I think regardless, it's in Web3's best interest to route capital and talent uh, to decentralized social technologies or Web3 projects that can bring the most positive impact in the world. This is a lot of one of the things I talk about a lot in my work is how do we rotate capital and talent from the degen projects to the regen projects? Uh, how do we make the market reward ethics? Because I think that once the market's rewarding the type of ethics that you talk about in this paper, then you'll just see a flow of innovation into into projects that that follow these guidelines and so um how do we rotate capital and talent into into these type of of projects because the market learns its lesson after ftx and after some of the hacks and ponzi schemes that were part of the last web uh cycle what would have to be true for the next cycle of capital and talent to roll into projects that are part of your vision uh maybe i'll go to you first danielle yeah, no, that's a great question. I think that's one we're trying to answer. So one of our projects, and this I could kind of put a call out to your listeners, honestly, is we're now really trying to identify um, use cases where people are wrestling with the question of how to structure experimentation and the like. And we are going to be identifying some use cases to dig into to try to give guidance in that regard. Um, I mean, we're doing some work at the moment on DAOs, for instance, because that does seem like there's a lot of sort of promising governance potential there. So we are ourselves trying to spot the places in the universe where we see pro-social benefits flowing um, and then sort of try to lift them up and elevate them, bring research attention to them, bring sort of validation from the research community about where value is, hoping to some extent to shift the value framework, you know, that way. Um, and that, obviously that can't do it in itself, but it can make a contribution to it. So um, that's a big part of it. Um, but I do think, you know, identifying the right kinds of problems to solve where there is value on the other side of a solution, um, even if it is sort of structured somewhat differently than the speculative market structure value is a part of the work. You know, I, the uh, thing that was sort of implicit in Daniel's answer, answer that I would emphasize really comes back to the pluralism point. I think that you get beneficial social change from the intersection of various dysfunctional sectors. So like the academy has a lot of limitations. Governments have a lot of limitations. 
civil society has a lot of limitations. Uh, the market, you know, especially the quite anarchic market in crypto has a lot of limitations. But out of them together might come something really interesting. So I think one major goal we have with this paper is to welcome into the conversation people from Danielle's academic world and maybe uh, eventually people from politics to not just uh, talk about what's happening in the space or be pro or anti, but to actually help shape it um, and to help promote uh, directions for it. And I think that's what we've seen in Taiwan. Um, and we've seen for years government investment in fundamental research in all sorts of areas, not so much in this area. Um, and I'd love, you know, if our efforts can help bring uh, some of those other sectors into proactive participation in helping to shape this space. Because I think if the logic of the, mar the market, you know, is the only logic here, we won't get to good outcomes. There have to be a lot of different logics at play that sort of like intertwine with each other to, to get good outcomes. Yeah, that's what I meant by yeah, plurality, but also that's what I meant by sort of structure of value. That is, it's yeah, even exactly. Glenn's way of putting it was better that market logics deliver one kind of structure of value, but that's not the only structure of value available to us. And it is true that the kind of intersection of public sector, civil society and the market can generate opportunities where there's another sort of pathway to value. It's structured differently than the market would structure it, um, but it exists. And so being really clear in sort of problem identification so that we're seeing those problems where solutions of that kind um, would make a huge difference is sort of, I think, a, a really important job. And, you know, I, I think it's important for people to keep in mind that that's how we got to the extent we got it at all, decentralization in Web1. It was not primarily driven by hackers who were anti-establishment. It was driven by government bureaucrats who were worried about disruption of centralized systems um, and them working with academics who had been trained in various social thinking. And then uh, that eventually offering commercial opportunities to scale it. So it was a it was very much a multi-sectoral collaboration. And I think if we want sustainable decentralization, it's critical that we do that again today and rather than just using one way of approaching the problem. Anything to add, Danielle? Well, I mean, I, I mean, sometimes I say to people, we get sort of stuck in this kind of false dichotomy between subsidize and privatize, um, as if those are the only two logics for achieving any major scale transformation. But there's a third logic, which I like just call you reorganize, um, which is exactly this matter of taking different sort of institutional configurations realigning them, reorganizing them with each other so that different kinds of human coordination are possible. And then boom, like huge amounts of value flows from that, um, you know, provided that the thing you're realigning to achieve is socially useful and valuable. I'm wondering if y'all can tell us about some of the values that you put forth in the paper. Uh, specifically, I'm looking at the human flourishing section where we talk about things like non-domination, individual and community self-determination, egalitarian pluralism, coordination capacity, collective ownership. Um, for me, these are our new sort of phrases and buzzwords. In, in Web3, we talk a lot about decentralization and sometimes public goods. But why, why these values? Why, why were these so important to you in writing the paper? Sure. Um, so I'll jump in on that one for starters. Um, so over you know the millennia, political philosophers have put forward any number of different theories of human well-being or human flourishing. So this framework represents, in some sense, the leading edge. Um, there are a number of different philosophers you can point to around the world. Philip Pettit, based mainly in Australia, Marcia Sen, connected to India, the UK, and the US, Elizabeth Anderson at the University of Michigan, myself, um, all of whom have um, really dug into the concept of human freedom and human well-being and made the case that... Um, the richest concept is one that centers an idea of non-domination. So it's a contrast between the idea that freedom is just freedom from interference. You know, the government should always just leave you alone. Anything the government does is interference versus a concept where the thing to avoid is domination. So arbitrary decision-making, um, for example, or illegitimate decision-making, um, but that in fact, uh, what we all need is sort of empowerment um, in both our private and our public lives as co-creators of the norms and constraints that shape the conditions for our action, 
Um, and then that the creation of those constraints always be non-dominating, hence the need for legitimacy and so forth, the legitimacy requirements. At any rate, so there's that sort of big body of work in the world of philosophy that is articulating this view um, for where the path of human flourishing is. It is also supportive of a pluralist view. The idea is not that human flourishing looks exactly the same for every human being. It's rather that if we are, again, empowered in our private lives and in our public lives as co-creators of norms and constraints, um, then we can all find our paths to flourishing, and we can also find the way of aligning our different paths of flourishing with one another for sort of broadly uh, positive social cooperation. Um, so the other concepts sort of flow out of that core idea, um, the commitment to egalitarian pluralism, um, decentralization, coordination capacity, and the like. Um, and so then one of the things we were really trying to do in the paper was to see where in the normative discourse in the Web3 or decentralized social technology space, we could see those concepts operating. And they don't always fit perfectly. So I want to be clear, it's not like there's a kind of one-to-one -one mapping between the philosophical concepts and the techno-normative concepts. Uh, but we did see people sort of pursuing sort of normative aspirations, you know, in the Web3 space or the DSOC space um, that seem to, you know, have some family resemblance to concepts in this picture of human flourishing. And so we wanted to push on that and figure out, you know, what more could be said? Could we tighten up the normative thinking um, in the um, tech space? Yeah, I mean, I guess the short, the short way I'd put it, Kevin, is that... Um... You know, there's a bunch of stuff that people talk about effectively normatively within the Web3 community. In fact, it's obsessed with various slogans like this. And then there's like mm -hmm. thousands of years of political philosophy, and the language is almost unrelated. So that seems kind of yeah. weird, you know? And so what we're trying to do is like find where we can build bridges, find where there's tensions. And also, maybe we didn't emphasize this as much, but I think one of the most interesting things is where can like problems and tensions on the ground within the web three community trying to live out those values like reflect limits of the philosophical concepts so like for example non-domination has i think a lot of relationship to this notion of trustlessness it means that like there's nobody who can take away from you something you know or nobody who can constrain you in certain ways but of course trustlessness has had a lot of issues uh in practice and i think not all of them are issues for non-domination but like they, they show some of the tensions that come out trying to uh, make a uh, non various visions of non dominant So it's in that back and forth that I think, you know, both philosophy and the Web3 community have a lot to gain. It was a super productive set of conversations, I will say. I mean, just to Glenn's point, and you can obviously hear in our answers, right, that I come from one very specific intellectual place and sort of background place and had a lot of learning to do. So the bridge building was an important part of this work. But as Glenn said, I mean, there is, you know, real sort of normative vocabulary, real questions about ethics. People are sort of probing and pushing, trying to understand, you know, people are trying to think about regenerative economies, for instance. Um, and so we really wanted to provide some anchors for that and um, give people the chance to connect to on both sides, academic and tech side, sort of connect to a conversation so people could see more what the stakes are of the ethical terms they're pursuing. Anything else you want to add, Glenn? Yeah, to me, that's all, again, just part and parcel of this thing of bringing different logics to bear on the same problems, letting people learn from each other rather than learn everything completely separately and you know, trying to um, find this cooperation across these different communities, even if it's not complete even if we're not going to make them the same discussions, at least we can help people see what the parallels are so that people can read those philosophical discussions and maybe gain something from them. Mm -hmm. You know, as, as we uh, discuss the paper, I'm, I find myself drawn to this, this line that I saw in the paper. Um, Many of the utopian and dystopian promises of decentralized social texts are hypothetical uh, and they're just projections about futures that the underlying technologies might support. And um, I just thought that that was kind of just very profound that we're projecting out into the future uh, what these technologies might support. And so that, that sort of leads to my question. If y'all are maximally successful, what does Web3 look like in five or 10 years? Uh, I think last question I went to you, Danielle, so maybe I'll go to you, Glenn. 
first on this one. So if you're maximally successful, if this paper is maximally impactful, what does Web3 look like in, in five or 10 years? Um, I hope Web3 is no longer a subculture. Uh, I hope that you know the, the learnings from it have suffused the broader culture. And on the other hand, the you know problems with it uh, have been sort of ironed out and, and made consistent with uh, you know broader social values. Uh, I hope that uh, a lot of the ideas that have been popularized through the Web three world are parts of mainstream systems. I hope we have you know sort of web of trust, pluralistic verification all over the place. Um, I hope we have a bunch of creative new ways of governance and decision making uh, being used by governments, but also by uh, new types of organizations. I hope we have um, lots of experiments with lots of new property regimes uh, going on, harnessing these technologies. And I hope a large chunk of it, though not all of it, is not for-profit businesses. Uh, there's lots of government support. There's lots of philanthropic support. There's lots of partnerships between private organizations and various kinds of charitable and public sector organizations. Um, yeah, no, I would um, second all of that. And I guess the way I would put it is I hope that in five years time, the use case that the general public thinks of when they hear about blockchain isn't cryptocurrency, actually, that so many other use cases have suffused the space that people realize it's a technological enablement that can solve problems you know, across domains, again, governance problems, verification problems, et cetera. So, um, yeah. Um, well, as as we're sort of getting towards the bottom of the hour, I'm wondering if there's anything that I didn't ask that y'all want to say. Maybe Danielle, I'll go to you first on this one. Well, I mean, for me, I am really interested in the question of what case studies feel the most pressing for people. And so I'd really love, again, to kind of put out a call and people can find us online at the Getting Plurality Network if you Google that, and there'll be a kind of point of contact. And if you have, um, if people, if listeners have cases where they're sort of wrestling with questions of ethics as they're trying to figure out how to deploy some element of decentralized social technology, we'd love to hear from people because um, we are really wanting to be responsive to the decisions people are actually facing. And I think we still have a lot of work to do, honestly, um, to be effective in offering you know, practices, protocols and the like for people to you know, be able to use the kind of ethics guardrails that we've tried to sketch out in the paper. Thanks, Danielle. We'll have a link to that in the show notes, the Getting Plurality Network, and people can reach out if they have ethical questions as they build DAOs in Web3 Tech. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Glenn, same question to you. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask that you want to say? Well, I'd, I'd love to welcome people's participation. Um, you can check it out at plurality.net uh, in the book that I'm writing with Audrey. It's an open Git-based collaboration. We'll be using a lot of the innovative governance approaches that we describe in the book and that you and I have talked about for so long that you talk about in Greenpilled as part of the book project. Um, and we'd like to help have people use those tools to co-create their vision of, of the future of them. So uh, that's my call for participation. Amazing. And I, I would also ask that the listeners read the paper. I, I read it over the last couple of days. It's really quite inspiring to, to hear how, uh, how you envision Web3 technologies and the ethics of decentralized social, um, especially knowing just how deeply connected in the space y'all are. Uh, you know, my work at Gitcoin was built foundationally on top of uh, quadratic funding and the decentralized society paper that Glenn and Vitalik and, uh, and Pooja put out uh, was really foundational. So um, Glenn, thank you for writing this paper, Congratulations on Danielle. your uh, exciting um, fundraising uh, effort recently around that paper. That's right, yeah. For, for the audience's benefit, uh, it wasn't my uh, fundraising 
uh, effort, uh, Gitcoin uh, had Glenn and Vitalik and Zoe sign the QF paper. And um, I also wrote an article and signed a paper and that was dropped as an NFT called Gitcoin Presents. And uh, I think it raised like 800K for the Gitcoin matching pool and for the Polarity, Plurality Institute. So thank you again for your support oh, of that, Glenn. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, I think I was meandering there, but what I wanted to say is that y'all have both been such an inspiration for me uh, and your work has been foundational for some of the stuff that I've worked on. And so um, if I can pay it forward and we can build this movement of plurality forward, that seems like a really exciting outcome for me. Fantastic. Let's Thank you, it. Kevin. Really appreciate your work. All right. So uh, call to action for the listener. Check out the Getting Plurality Network. Check out plurality.net and read the paper. There will be links in the show notes for each of those. Thanks so much for joining me, Danielle and Glenn. Thanks, Kevin. See you.